The early 1930s was a really interesting time in the automotive industry. Uh, of course, the stock market crashed in New York in October of 1929, but its effects were not felt as immediately as we think today. There were lots of products in the pipeline in the late 1920s, and the automotive manufacturers were keen to see them come to fruition. And an interesting uh, part of this scene was what's now referred to as the Cylinder Wars. The leading luxury manufacturers of the world all sought to compete with themselves to build the best V8, V12, and even V16 power plants. The car I'm driving today is a great example of those Cylinder Wars. It's a 1932 Marmon 16 LeBaron Coupe. And the 16-cylinder engine has a particular resonance in the automotive canon. V8s are great, V12s are wonderful, but a V16, it's so exotic. Even today, when Bugatti builds their W16 engine, there's something very special about that number of cylinders. And of course, what's really most interesting is the fact that manufacturers back in the 1930s weren't thinking of a 16-cylinder engine car in terms of power. Even today, you can still get a lot of power out of a four-cylinder engine, but it was about smoothness. And in the luxury market, that was king. A V8 was nice, but I mean, <laughs> Ford built a V8, so the masses had eight cylinders in a V. So a V12 was something very special and something that denoted great luxury and, and ease. And what could even top that? A 16. So the Marmon Company of Indianapolis started to develop a very sophisticated V16 engine in the mid-1920s. Its lead engineer, Owen Knacker, created this very sophisticated overhead valve 16-cylinder engine out of aluminum, a very lightweight and powerful engine. And unfortunately, uh, in a great example of the fact that uh, industrial espionage is not new, he was recruited by Cadillac in 1927 and took with him in his head all of the ideas for the 16-cylinder engine, which enabled GM to come out with their V16 in 1930, a year before Marmon got theirs to market. Now, that was sort of unfortunate in that obviously they lost the first to market advantage that Cadillac enjoyed, but the Marmon V16 was certainly worth the, wa the weight. The Cadillac V16 was rather heavy and put out 165 horsepower. The Marmon 16 engine was much lighter and put out 200 horsepower, comparable in power, surpassed rather by in power only by the Duesenberg straight eight. And this is an engine again, not built for speed. It's built to provide the ultimate in sophisticated, easy, luxury touring. Now, of course, it's not that uh, the Marmon Company was uh, unknown for speed. Uh, of course, all manufacturers raced back at the beginning of the 20th century, but Marmon also holds the incredible uh, distinction of having, with the Marmon Wasp, won the first Indianapolis 500 race in 1911. So the Marmon Company knew something about building engines. And the engine is really the heart and soul of this Marmon 16 coupe. The Marmon was also interesting as a luxury car, as opposed to a Cadillac or a Peerless or a Pierce Arrow or even uh, a Packard. The customer that bought a Marmon was someone who was quiet. They certainly had the means to buy a very expensive car. This car, for instance, had a chassis price in 1932 of over $5,000. But they didn't want to show it off. The Marmons are very quiet cars. And that also, perhaps, led to their undoing. Uh, because their sales were not very strong and they were forced to uh, go out of business uh, by 1936. Uh, they built very few of these 16-cylinder cars, especially compared to Cadillac. The car I'm driving today is one of the rarest. It's one of only six surviving LeBaron two-door coupes, and arguably, certainly in my opinion, one of the most attractive, if not the most attractive, Marmons built. This is a car of supreme quiet elegance. The lines are absolutely beautiful, elemental, the form is absolutely perfect. It doesn't say sporty, it says quiet elegance, 
it's a gentleman in a bow tie and a great felt hat and a wonderful jacket. Oh, well, that could be me. Um, but it doesn't scream, I'm here to spend a lot of money and go really fast. As a matter of fact, it's very quietness. Again, sets it apart from some of the other great cars of the period. You look at this dashboard, it's completely functional. A grain painted metal plate with white on black gauges tells you everything you need to know. The uh, oil pressure, the speed, engine water temperature, the charging of the battery, gas gauge, and the time of day. But it doesn't do it in a way like, for instance, uh, a Mercedes 540 might have with mother of pearl uh, gauge faces and beautiful inlay wood dash to support the gauges. It's painted metal. And on a car that costs this amount of money, which was far more than most people earn in a year, it's sort of surprising, but again, fits the character of the car. And I think it really makes this Marmon very special for that reason. It's a comfortable car, but a car of quiet comfort. In today's driving conditions, it's very interesting to see how tractable this car is. 200 horsepower, albeit in a heavy car, is still very usable. And when you think about 200 horsepower in 1932, this really is a luxury supercar. There is no modern equivalent for a car like this. I, I really racked my, my, my brains trying to think of what it might be. Um, for instance, if Audi built a car that matched Rolls-Royce's level of trim and, and detail, it might be the kind of car that this Marmon was back in 1932 for people who didn't want to buy a Rolls Royce. But there is no equivalent. There's a yawning gap in the market today for a car of quiet uh, elegance. Um, the Bentley has certainly gone to back to its more sporting roots. Uh, Mercedes missed the mark, unfortunately, with a relaunch of the Maybach. Um, and so there is no modern Marmon. Perhaps this is something that some great entrepreneur might uh, take up, because I think that there is a space in the market for a car like this today. When you think about the time of the cylinder wars as well, it wasn't just in the US. The European manufacturers also got in on the act. Hispano Suiza, quite famously, with the J12, their spectacular 12-cylinder engine, and even Rolls-Royce was forced to come up with a 12-cylinder um, counterpart in their line, the Phantom III. But they weren't the cars that, that these American cars were. Driving a vintage car like this always reminds me of the true thrills of involved driving. Yes, it's got a powerful and smooth engine, but you have to pay attention to the steering. You have to double clutch on the shifts to make them nice and quiet. And it's so satisfying when you can get that done. Also, of course, like most cars of this age, it prefers speed over low speed maneuverability. Like most cars of this age, for maneuverability, it prefers to be moving. It's not a car that you want to parallel park. U-turns uh, require advanced planning, and in most cases, a three or four point turn. But once it's on the road, it's lively and, 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 and I might even say slightly fun. Cruising along here in top gear, you literally only hear the wind. There is no sense of the engine itself. At idle, the same is true. You get a sense of those 16 cylinders at acceleration in first gear because it's rather short. But it is a wonderful car to drive and a testament to great engineering and imagination in a very difficult time.